My name is Peter Miller, and uh, I'm the dean here. And on behalf of the director, Susan Weber, it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you, those whom I'm looking at now, uh, and those who, uh, unfortunately, uh, for the moment, have my rear. Uh, and to those who are watching around the world on BGC TV, welcome to you also, in whatever time zone you may be in. It's an especial pleasure for me and us here to host all of you as individuals and as a project. Uh, in many ways, history and material culture world perspectives is an ideal project for this institution, and uh, ideal really in three different ways. First of all, for an institution which has material culture in its title, uh, it's a given. For an institution which over the 20 years of its existence, and this is its 20th year, has made the study of the material remains of the past as a form of understanding its project. This seems in many ways like a kind of coming of age volume for the institution as well. For an institution that has accompanied its teaching program of masters and PhDs with a full-time working gallery in which exhibitions are mounted every year with the express purpose of taking a body of material and understanding it in its own terms and as a marker of historical change. Again, all of that seems, in retrospect anyway, to have been a preparation for this very moment. The second reason why it's a perfect project uh, for us is that as an institution, as a thinking place, our style has been based on really two, two main terms, both of which come to us from uh, the Latin past, conversation and collaboration. The give and take that is a conversation, not one person dictating to another. And of course, the idea of working together. Uh, both of these, in terms of internal practice here, the way in which we teach, the way in which we run our research programs, and the way in which the institution interacts with the outside world, with the various institutions, both academic and museological, with which we collaborate, this idea of sharing and joining in the pursuit of something bigger is something that we do as a matter uh, of course. And in many ways, this is the kind of collaboration, projects of this sort, which uh, are what we in the humanities do, even though it's often seen that the, uh, and thought that the humanities are non-collaborative, full of people who prefer to sit in rooms by themselves with the doors closed. I think that the fact that there are 50 or 60 people sitting in this room, albeit with the door closed, su <laughs> suggests that that there is life in our kind of collaboration as well and a future uh, that uh, it can be proud of. The third reason why it's a perfect project for us is that uh, it allows us here to work with our friends. And I'll start off first by acknowledging John Prown uh, and the Chipstone Foundation, which is the co-sponsor of this event and indeed of this project. Uh, and John has been a friend, <coughs> both personally and uh, intellectually for the institution, uh, and a great model of this idea of conversation, conversation uh, and collaboration. Uh, and not to, to steal the thunder of this event, but it's also, I think, appropriate to say that uh, starting next year, uh, we're kicking off a five-year a uh, collaborative project with the Chipstone Foundation to create an object lab at the Bard Graduate Center, which in working with the Chipstone Foundation will try and advance the idea of continuing innovation in the study of objects and teaching students to work with objects in interesting ways. So it's an auspicious uh, occasion for that. But many of you as well have been here before, uh, and it's a pleasure to see the old faces inviting you back. Uh, and for those who are new faces, uh, it's great to make your acquaintance. And on behalf of the institution, I wish you uh, a good visit. And I look forward to welcoming, in turn, you back in the future for uh, further projects. And so with that, I come to conclusion. I bid you all uh, and myself uh, a good voyage for these next two days, a voyage uh, of learning and conversation, uh, at the end of which not only will we come closer to the projected volume uh, at the end uh, of the tunnel, but also I think uh, we'll come away with friends with whom we'll want to discuss many of these things uh, independently in the future. So welcome and thank you very much. And uh, 
Yeah, Chipstone is, is very much looking forward to working with, with BARD. And uh, I was just going to blast through some images to talk a little bit about our practice. Because in a, in a, in a certain way, we were kind of a, a, a different manifestation of many of the same ideas that, that underlie this book and, or this publication. And we're just practitioners in a different manner. And uh, also, folks don't know much about the Chipstone Foundation. We're located out in Fox Point, Wisconsin, which is the top side of Milwaukee. Uh, Polly and Stanley Stone built this house in 1950. It was actually designed by a Colonial Williamsburg architect who they brought out to create their kind of their own Georgian on steroids out in Wisconsin. <laughs> and so, this is the architectural masterpiece that Sarah and I dance around in all day. And, uh, uh, they obviously were, were coming out of kind of that colonial revival aesthetic, very much in, inspired by the, the early installations at places like the Met and MFA Boston and Philadelphia and the American Wing and the Virginia Room. And so this is, what, this is what Chipstone was when the stones were there. But when they set up the foundation, they just set up an, an entity that was supposed to be of service to the field in general. Um, and with a real eye towards education, towards helping specialist scholars, students, practitioners. And so Chipstone is involved in a number of initiatives. We publish two uh, journals that are kind of the journals of record for early American furniture and early Anglo-American ceramics. Um, these you can buy in the expensive hard copy form. Um, we'll actually give them to you for free because we have so many sitting in the basement. <laughs> um, but we're also... I mean, we were selling these at the NSICA event recently for five bucks a pop, and they cost us like 200 bucks a copy to make, so it's an epic money loser. But, um, but they're beautiful, right? <laughs> um, but on the, on the other hand, uh, we also present these virtually, and, and we have huge usage online, hundreds of thousands of uses, so that's good. We, we've done, we're very teamed up with, with um, the art history team at UW-Madison, or friend Henry Drool is here and we created with Ann Smart Martin the Digital Library for Decorative Arts which um, you know is, a, is kind of a straightforward virtual project but curiously it's emerged uh, over the last couple of years as either the first or second most used database on the entire Madison campus and when I ask them why they can't explain it so uh, it's, it's kind of a strange it's, it's one of the strange projects where they can't even quite figure out the metrics that are driving it. We also have hooked up with Art Babel. We're very interested in museum practice. We're very interested in the whole, in, in issues about thinking, about making, um, and video has emerged as, as a great way to do this, whether you're, whether you're videotaping performances, lectures, student-based projects. We, we actually do a lot of work with our students where they create videos with professional videographers and sound people, so they have kind of a, a useful finished product. And we work with Art Babel, which is that entity that was created as a way for museums to, to display their video projects somewhere other than YouTube, where you're competing with cat videos and things like that. Uh, we, our museum practice began in earnest uh, through a collaborative effort with the Milwaukee Art Museum, and this is the Santiago Calatrava literally the wing that was added on in 2001. And so it's a rather spectacular place to work. And part of what, part of what all of us who are involved with Chipstone uh, are, are driving towards is, is to sort of move beyond normative practice for a whole lot, for all the same reasons, you know, everyone in this room is in, in their own way moving beyond normative practice and to sort of explore the other ways of thinking about objects and to, to get past this kind of straight line display and to move into to modes of interpretation that are perhaps more thematic, more visually engaging. And I, th I think one of the lessons that we're learning through our practices, uh, and you run into this as kind of a straw man argument with the, the more conventional institutions, is, is they'll say, oh, well, to make it accessible, you have to dumb it down. Well, I, no, it's the other way around. You smart it up. Um, and so we've been involved, uh, this, this last room was, was a way of looking at the idea of the Rococo, but really putting it in the context of, of sort of classical chaos, this notion that, that's really embedded in Western culture in a lot of different ways. We're, we're very interested in various kinds of thematic uh, exploration, so the notion of value, where in this show, 
On the left side of the room, we looked at literal value, the cost of things then and now. But then on the right hand side of the show, we looked at the human cost of things. The fact that many of the beautiful things that are in museums, mirrors, uh, uh, mahogany furniture, uh, lead glazed earthenware, people died to make those things. And so to bring that part into the story, we're very into a, into a kind of uh, breakdown of, of conventional uh, linear narratives, kind of straight line art history that has so long defined deck arts objects. So to think more uh, as cultural anthropologists and to ask, for example, with New York tables of this sort that were made 1810, 1820, uh, forget that they're neoclassical, forget all the basic deck arts um, uh, sort of straightforward facts about it, and fundamentally ask, why are they making tables with monsters on them? How does this fall into kind of a, an, an exploration or an iteration of mythology? Um, or, or to think about the tea table, which um, when in fact you start to engage with it through the lens of anthropology, um, when you start to actually sit at it and think about what's happening, you realize it's much more it's, it's less about the T than it is about the interaction between hu two human beings. And it's the physical, the, the emotional, and even the sexual interaction. So these things, these things become something rather different. Uh, we're very into the power of the cabinet and the whole idea of the Wunderkammer. So we, we created one working collaboratively again with Mark, Martha Glowacki, who's this great curator, natural historian, artist out in Madison. And a lot that we do in, gets into the realm of, of sort of handing over or sharing curatorial authority. And that's one of the big, that's one of the big uh, hurdles that you run into in museums, is that curators sort of have their set way of doing things, and they don't necessarily play well with others. <coughs> whereas whereas we, we sort of like to jump out of the sandbox and go play with people uh, all over the place. And, and, and again, the, that, that sort of is the apt reflection of transdisciplinary practice in the 21st century. So uh, in our Wunderkammer, we just let Martha go. And she actually, and it, and it stemmed from a discussion where she walked into Chipstone and she said, you guys live in a cabinet. That's <laughs> this place is. So we're like, oh, well, tell us more. Um, and, and so here, for example, she was uh, exploring the, um, sort of the, the basic attributes of, of, of uh, the natural world and sort of exploring why a Christopher Townsend architectonic high chest of drawers nevertheless has highly animated legs and feet that, that sort of break down its whole architectural propriety. We, we went and copied the uh, Halle cabinet, which was the great uh, 18th century cabinet was, that was created in Germany to house a 16th century collection. And then we just simply created our own categories up top that fit our collection. And that's, that, that again is the great thing. And so one of the things we're talking with the folks at BART, they have a cabinet room upstairs as well. So it's a question of simply how do you activate it in a way that is of use to a lot of people. Uh, this is just a recent installation we did. We're very into creating spaces that, again, move beyond kind of the conventional white cube, put things on a pedestal, line them up against the wall approach. So we were thinking about transfer printed ceramics, which really are best understood as being part of, of 17th, 18th century Western print culture in general. So we created one of these British print rooms where people literally were cutting prints out and pasting them on the wall as wallpaper. Um, and, and sort of putting it in that kind of context where it was, was very much about the larger notion of print culture. This was kind of fun because Sarah and I, we had to do the gluing. And we had <laughs> no clue what we were doing. So it was quite a mess. And, but nevertheless, we got this space up. We, we like to do various kinds of remixes and inversions as a way of moving beyond normative practice. So this was a show we're, we're very fortunate to have access to, in Chipstone's collection and some local collections to just A plus early American objects, just killer things. But nevertheless, we sort of wanted to invert the way one might think about these. So this show, for example, we put together all things that are stylish at some point go out of style. So we paired the best objects with the worst things ever said about them. <laughs> and, and it proved to be a very powerful and very clear message for the visitor. So yes, the thing is, mm -hmm. is ugly and tasteless on the right. And, and, uh, we do a lot in the realm of African-American material culture. We've worked 
with a, a variety of different practitioners, um, Theaster Gates, who we teamed up with again recently. Um, we've worked a lot with Dave the Potter, who was an enslaved potter in Edgefield, uh, and whose story has been appropriated by multiple uh, communities. Uh, it's really sort of fascinating to see but certainly a very apt person to talk about in a community like Milwaukee, which is one of the most segregated cities in America, where a mile to the west of where we sit, there's, there's you know, huge poverty and, and an African-American population that doesn't feel well served by some of the museums and educational institutions in town. So we go, we're, we're going into uh, community centers. We do a lot in terms of uh, moving into the realm of social media and, and again trying to, to take our practice in, in a little bit more public manner. We just recently did a show, uh, a very powerful show that was about these Edgefield face jugs. We do a lot with the issue of race and representation and so often in the deck arts world there's not, there has not tended to be this drive towards interpretation. It's just sort of, you know, quick identify what it is, put it in its category and then put it on display when in fact you're dealing with these face jugs that were made in the 1860s and 70s by enslaved um, um, African Americans, um, these things were always set aside as just being whimsies, when in fact the research is increasingly showing that these were ritualistic, tied to um, African, Western African practice, and uh, most, uh, very often potentially used as conjure pots, which brings in all kinds of, of meanings about covert and overt activity at the time. We, we also try to activate our galleries. We bring in, um, we do poetry slams in the galleries, try to bring in uh, different communities, different age groups, and, and again, to sort of work with forms of, of discourse that move beyond just the conventional curator lecturing to a crowd. Let them, let, let these kids lecture to us through their poetry. Uh, we do a lot with moving beyond the label, which can be a really problematic thing. I mean, the label sort of sustains normative practice as well and, and the sort of the, the burdensome use of jargon. So this was one funny room we created. Uh, we, we tend to have a strategy of leap before you look, which <laughs> drives Sarah nuts, but it, it's, it's in my comfort zone. But. It's good for me. Yeah. Um, you have a safety harness on. So. <laughs> right. um, but so, for example, in talking about process, we built a circular room and put up six 58-inch screens and uh, no curatorial voice, just the visuals, beautifully wrought visuals of things being made and the sounds of them being made. And it was easily one of the most effective installations we've ever done. And visitors walked out knowing so much more than we ever could have communicated to them in a label. So it changes your notion uh, as a curator of what you're supposed to do. And they're good moments. We've gotten into the realm of digital production. Uh, by the way, over at Museum of Art and Design, there's a really neat, uh, the post-digital show over there is, is really a, a, a cool manifestation of, of sort of 21st century practices. Uh, so just in a nutshell, uh, I, I think it's fair to say that, I, um, that the project that Sarah and Ivan are overseeing is very much uh, in our minds as a, as a really pertinent and meaningful form of practice, and, and I'm really glad that you all are here to participate. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, I'm Ivan Gaskell, uh, and I teach here at the Bard Graduate Center, and I'm sitting next to my co-conspirator, Sarah Ann Carter, from the Chipstone Foundation. You have us to blame for being here. Uh, you have also, uh, uh, there are others who are bear some of the guilt as well, and I'll say a bit more about them in a minute. Uh, but I'm just so delighted that you have all come and uh, have signed up for this adventure. Uh, so I'm going to say a little bit very briefly about structure, and Sarah is going to say a little bit about what we hope to achieve over these two days. I want to thank a lot of people uh, starting here at the Bard Graduate Center, I certainly want to thank our director, Susan Weber, and our dean, uh, Peter Miller, for their unstinting support uh, that has made this whole uh, event possible. And I also want to thank our, our dean for administration, Sue, uh, Eleanor uh, si Pinto Simon, who's sitting, lurking at the back there. Uh, she's actually one of the most uh, important people in the room. Uh, and our Chief Operating Officer, Tim Ettenheim, who holds the purse strings, very important. Um, 
There are others in development and external affairs, in uh, in uh, facilities and, and security, the gallery staff. We will have a reception uh, this evening uh, in, in the gallery for all the contributors. Uh, and uh, the faculty, uh, some of whom are here. Uh, we have a principal at the Bard Graduate Center that every uh, event is open to all faculty, staff, and students. Uh, we don't have closed-door events within the institution. So I'm so delighted that a number of our faculty and staff colleagues are here, and students as well. Very, very important. Um, I also want to thank, in particular, Mark LeBlanc, uh, who is also lurking. There he is. You stand up, Mark, please. Uh, Mark has... Uh, Mark has done everything that actually has to be done to make this happen. So many thanks. Then, of course, the Chipstone Foundation. This is a joint venture uh, between the Bard Graduate Center and Chipstone Foundation. Those of you who came on airplanes, uh, that seat you were on, however small it was, <laughs> half of that seat was paid for by the Chipstone Foundation. Uh, so I really want to thank the director. That's just a lovely picture. <laughs> <laughs> One buttock. <laughs> So thanks, John, for, for making for, for, for being up, uh, partnering with us for this. I also want to mention uh, the Delmas Foundation uh, for uh, their support in the form of a publication subvention. Very, very important. Uh, and then, then the uh, responsibility is not the Bard Graduate Center, is not Ch Chipstone, it is Oxford University Press. And I want to thank uh, Nancy Toff, Vice President and Executive Editor, who is right over there. Right over there. Stand up, Nancy, <laughs> so everyone can run from you. <laughs> and, and Nancy's colleague, Rebecca Hecht, who's seated beside her. Uh, Nancy uh, started this whole thing. And it's, so it's thanks, it's thanks to her that Sarah and I have, take, uh, have taken on the editorship of, of this daunting project of the uh, Oxford Handbook of History and Material Culture. So many thanks, Nancy. Structure. When, when we were asked to do this book, my first instinct was to run a mile. But Nancy, <laughs> who's someone like a puma, can give chase at great speed and can bring her prey down. So Sarah and I succumbed, uh, but, but we had a certain set of organizational principles in mind. And these are, I'm going to summarize them in five. First, that we should treat human history as a project with chronological depth. There should be no limit to how far back among us we can go in, in human, in hominin history. Second, we should explore the earth, not just a privileged bit of it. And this is not a stipulation in the, in the spirit of globalization, but of what Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak calls the planetary. We want to acknowledge that while there may be power differentials among human communities, there are both share, shared concerns and differences that exist in ever-changing tension within each. Third, that we should look at the ways in which people might ma make history using material traces of the past in a thematic manner rather than by chronological or geographical arrangement. And we identified five themes. And they're far from the only ones that could apply. But Sarah and I feel confident that they will open up debate in fruitful ways. And these five uh, I think you're all aware of them, but I'm going to list them still. Material culture and technology, material culture and the symbolic, material culture and cognition, material culture and social distinction, and material culture and memory. Now, there's a huge variety of case studies within each of these categories. The topics that you have chosen follow each other in unconventional ways, not respecting normative assumptions that the European medieval cases or the sub-Saharan African cases should be together. 
Sarah and I know that this is but one way of approaching the underlying puzzles associated with doing history with tangible things. We expect that patience and suspension of disbelief and, to be frank, overcoming a lack of focused interest in unfamiliar topics on your parts can really pay off. We must all, I think, be alert to the likelihood of illumination by sudden and unexpected and oblique shafts of light rather than uh, by the direct floodlighting that we may be used to. Fourth, uh, although this is determinedly a history project, Sarah and I believe that learning to translate aspects of the ever-elusive past to the ever-shifting present can only proceed where material things are concerned by collaboration among disciplines. That's why we've invited not only historians, but archaeologists, anthropologists, art historians, a theorist of religion, uh, even a philosopher. Uh, and I'm glad to say that this interdisciplinary way of working doesn't so much as turn a hair at either the BGC or the Chipstone Foundation. Though at some institutions, whatever their rhetoric, it certainly does. So we're on friendly ground here. Fifth, and last, thinking of institutional frameworks of inquiry, it's vitally important, I think, that our shared endeavor is not confined to one kind of place in terms of your affiliations and professional lives. We have scholars from very varied colleges and universities and from museums of various kinds, and we meet on common even ground, sharing a commitment to understanding how past and present might relate to each other by appealing to material things. This need not be a matter even of subscribing to hegemonic European and Euro uh, ways of conceiving of these concepts and relationships between them. And I hope everyone might be comfortable with the idea that coherence is not necessarily the best policy. <laughs> and that we inhabit not a single comprehensible world, but worlds. So just some very brief welcome remarks to add to what, what Ivan and John and Peter have just offered us. Now, as you've no doubt noticed in reading through the abstracts, or if you've been able to read through the drafts that everyone has submitted, we have an extremely varied group of <laughs> papers and projects, almost unbelievably so. And when I was talking with Ivan about this last week, I was saying what I, I hope is that we don't just have a situation in which with the final product we have something in which a person interested in pianos or punks or pearls can open it up and say, ah, oh, here's a great essay about pearl diving or here's a fascinating essay about punks and stick pins. No. What we hope is that, well, yes, those are fascinating essays people can dip into and read, but we hope that we'll have something that is much more cohesive. <laughs> something that will really challenge our readers and our students to be thinking a little bit more deeply about what material culture can possibly offer to the study of history. I mean, that's the broader goal that we have here. The five categories that Ivan has outlined are things that we really went back and forth over and finally said, you know, there are many ways that the papers that you've all submitted could fit into different categories. But these are five that we feel can stand up over time and we hope we can discuss and interrogate those a little bit more over the next two days. But we hope that our readers will recognize that these are five key ways that material things, study of the material world, can engage, transform, enhance ways that we practice history. I know in many ways we are preaching to the converted in this room and that you are all individuals who work with objects in different ways. But we hope that this collection will allow us to reach beyond the confines of this space and to reach people who are not just, um, or who are not people engaged in objects typically in their practice. As Ivan has already mentioned, this is a project that we hope has a global reach, but we are not interested in the um, homogenizing effects of globalization, transforming these into papers that all suggest that the same kinds of topics that you might discuss in um, Sri Lanka could help us understand what's happening are, excuse me, are the same as what we might find in, um, in an American context or in another context. We hope that in focusing on um, material things and focusing on objects, we're able to develop a sort of material pluralism, 
a way of thinking about the specifics of different places, of different times, of different material things can help us understand how objects can be useful to historians and history more broadly.